Welcome, dear readers. You're listening to Time to Read, a Winnipeg Public Library podcast book club. We are coming to you from our butler's pantry, better known as the Carol Shields Auditorium, which is located in the Millennium Library Estate. We are, of course, located on Treaty 1 territory and on land that is the traditional territory of the Anishinaabe, Cree, Oji Cree, Dakota, and Dene peoples, and the homeland of the Métis Nation. In this episode, we will discuss The Remains of the Day by Kazu Ishiguru. If there is a book you think we should discuss in the future, let us know at WP podcast at winnipeg.ca. I'm Mr. Chorney, and to my left is... Hi, I'm uh, Mrs. Ball. I'm the branch head at Fort Gary Library. Across the table for me is... Hi, I'm Mr. Lockhart, and I work at the Louis Rail Library, where I strive to serve with dignity. And to my right is... Hi, I'm Mr. Penner. I work in the Idea Mill, and I hope, as it were, to employ a humorous witticism at some point during this episode. Uh, banter. Yes. Uh, <laughs> 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 a good book can carry me away from an ever engine hold an you, dear readers, we couldn't do this without you. It's your questions and comments that form the heart of our discussion, so make us laugh or make us cry by emailing us at wpl-podcast at winnipeg.ca or leave a comment on our website, wpl-podcast.winnipeg.ca. Find out if your comment made it on the air by subscribing to Time to Read on iTunes, Google Play, YouTube, and other fine podcasting services. In a moment, Trevor will start us off by giving a brief bio of Kazu Ishiguru, followed by Erica, who will spoil everything with a brief synopsis. Then it is on to the discussion, which you can get in on by emailing us at wpl-podcast at winnipeg.ca or finding us on Facebook. Don't forget to stick around to the end for a special segment, Nerd Words for Word Nerds. Trevor, over to you. Kazuo Ishiguro was born in Nagasaki in 1954, just nine years after that city was bombed along with Hiroshima at the end of the Second World War. His family immigrated to Britain when he was five, as his father was an oceanographer and was doing research at the National Oceanography Centre in Southampton. He graduated with a Master of Arts in Creative Writing in 1980 from the University of East Anglia. His first two novels were set in Japan, but as he hadn't been back to Japan since the age of five, it was a make-believe Japan that he conjured up, as his only point of reference was growing up in Britain. And he said, I've always said that throughout my career, although I've grown up in this country and am educated in this country, that a large part of my way of looking at the world, my artistic approach, is Japanese because I was brought up by Japanese parents speaking in Japanese and have always looked at the world through my parents' eyes. As he developed his career as a writer, Ishiguru also worked as a residential resettlement worker at West London Homelessness Charity, where he met his future wife, a social worker. In addition to the seven novels to date, he has written screenplays, and even song lyrics. He was a guest on the British radio show Desert Island Discs, and he named his seven favorite songs, including Stacey Kent's recording of You Can't Take That Away From Me. And after that episode, Ms. Kent and Ishiguru developed a creative partnership, and he has since written many songs for her. In 1989, his novel The Remains of the Day won the Booker Prize, and was adapted into a film starring Anthony Hopkins and Emma Thompson, garnering eight Oscar nominations. In 2017, he was awarded the Nobel Prize in Literature. Ishiguru almost always writes in the first-person narrative style, and his novels often end without resolution. The characters tend to land on a note of melancholic resignation. They accept their past and who they have become, typically discovering that this realization brings comfort and an end to mental anguish. And this follows the Japanese idea of mono no aware, which could be loosely translated as the beauty of impermanence. In February of this year, Ishiguru was knighted for his services to literature. So, Sir Kazoo has a nice ring to it. Mm -hmm. And since Kristen isn't here, I'm going to extend an invitation to Sir Kazoo uh, to come to her place for supper (laughs) if if he's ever in Winnipeg. The Remains of the Day is a subtle, sad, and humorous love story, as well as a portrayal of a vanished way of life and a meditation on the high cost of duty and service. In the summer of 1956, Stevens a man who has dedicated his life to becoming the perfect butler in the one-time great house of Darlington Hall, sets off on a holiday that will take him deep into the English countryside and unexpectedly into his own past, especially his friendship with the housekeeper, Miss Kenton. Memories begin to surface of his lifetime in service to Lord Darlington and of his life between the wars, 
when the fate of the continent seemed to lie in the hands of a few men. He finds himself confronting the dark undercurrent beneath the carefully run world of his employer, as well as that of the life he could have had, but for a few different choices. And that's adapted from the publisher blurb. I guess for me, what I remember about discussing about picking this book is that we wanted to do a romance. And I'm now I'm wondering if you guys consider this book a romance. It does not fit the genre definition of a romance, which I learned recently. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, There's no. love in there. Yes, but, but love does not a romance make. It does not. No. Do you want to know the criteria? I do. So the technical criteria for the romance genre is that the relationship is the primary driving factor in the novel. It's the relationship between two people and that it ends happily. It ends in a marriage or in a partnership. Oh, interesting. I thought uh, when I was reading this novel, I thought of it as much more of a character study. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Like uh, all the different ways you can look at it, everything that drives it is his character. Yeah. There's, yeah, there's not a lot of like plot points moving forward it's all him thinking about his life one of the questions that we asked is is could a romantic relationship between miss kenton and stevens ever have worked and i'm wondering if you guys got the impression that stevens ever wanted a relationship with her because i don't looking back on it i don't know that he did no the defining characteristic of Stevens was his single-minded pursuit of being the perfect butler and he, he described it at one point he said he inhabited the role he literally wanted to be a butler mm-hmm. in the sense that there was no person there. He was he was lit- wanting to be a function, and there's no room in that function for romance. Mm-hmm. Or love. <laughs> or no, it, anything. <laughs> well, exactly. And I think maybe his idea, maybe he was getting from the relationship with Miss Kenton what he uh, needed, mm-hmm. uh, but she wasn't. Mm-hmm. And and she her idea of a relationship was something much more what uh, conventional, what we thought, you know, getting married and maybe starting a family, that kind of thing. He was very happy, as you said, Dennis, to be the butler and to have her as an associate. And I think he definitely enjoyed Miss Kenton. He enjoyed their talks, their, their hot chocolate mm-hmm. uh, meetings or whatever. Coco. <laughs> yeah, the Coco. You know, but uh, but you're right. Like, his, his, there's one part of the book where he talks how important his the, the butler's pantry is, and how that's the only time really a butler should uh, be not on duty, and and it, he he kind of guarded that little area of of mm-hmm. the house and his life really carefully, and he wouldn't let anyone in. Even and so, the idea of Miss Kenton showing up with some flowers to try to brighten it up, it's a lovely thought, but it was but, not what he wanted ever. There was even like. One of the things that struck me about his character throughout is that he never allowed himself to express a personal desire of any kind. Mm -hmm. Like, even though that was his his private hour when Miss Kenton came in and Mm -hmm. essentially tried to seduce him, right? He was like, well, this is my one hour and I, you know, I wanted to read. And it's like, oh, well, what are you reading? Oh, it's just like a a general romance. (laughs) And, And then... He can't even say he enjoys it as a a book. He says, well, this helps me to keep my vocabulary up so that I can talk to people respectfully. It's like, like, what? To to command and master the language. You can just like the book. That's okay. Or when he gets to go on that drive and he's like, well, I could try to do, take care of a staffing issue. Yes. Mm -hmm. He had to turn everything into something related to his role as a butler. Where do you think that came from? Well, his dad. <laughs> yeah, what's the deal with that? Oh man, that that scene where his dad was dying, right? Oh my gosh! And he and he can't even talk to him like his father is. I'm I'm glad father is feeling better. One is yeah. one is glad father. Well, yeah, it, some, I can't even yeah. remember. Yeah. Said Which I. makes me wish that we could have like flashed back to his father and his father's yeah. romance with his mother to see how his father incorporated that yeah. into his life. That's a good point. I didn't even think about that, but <laughs> yeah. yeah, like yeah. his father stopped at some point to yeah. do something personal. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Unless he was thinking he had to raise the perfect butler that he did not attain right. himself. Because <laughs> when he was dying, his, yeah. his, the thing he said to his son is like, is everything in hand? Yeah. Yeah. That was his concern. Yeah. And Stevens was correct when he said, you know, my father would want me to continue service. Mm-hmm. He would have. He would have yep. been upset if he hadn't. Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah, because Stevens is even talking about like, I, he, I think he even tells Miss Kenton, like, my dad would want me to not go or mm-hmm. would not me to yeah. w- w- not want me to be. Yeah. with him but to make sure the house was in order yeah and at the end of that whole uh reminiscence the reader like it's myself like i was choked up over what happened but did you cry 
I didn't cry, <laughs> Alan. No, I didn't. I kept it together. But, uh, but you know, but Stevens himself looked on it as a point of pride that yeah. he said, look how good of a butler I was. Mm-hmm. I, despite all of the adversity that evening, I was still able mm-hmm. to, yeah. you know, do everything Although I needed to be done. he was crying. He was serving and crying. Yeah, yeah. Well, and everyone was just kind of looking around. Like, You're right say, there, Stevens. Yeah, yeah. yeah. He's like, your eyes are, they said something about it like, yeah. that indicated that he was crying. Yeah, his father's death was his tiger. That's right. Right? Like they, yeah. They'd made that right. point about his father's story. Yeah. Yeah. About holding it together under ridiculous circumstances. Mm-hmm. And, and he did that twice in the book. Yeah. And yeah. both of them were sacrificing mm-hmm. his relationships, Yeah, essentially. Yeah. yeah, and it's funny because, well, like the impression that I got from like the things about the book, like the blurb and whatever that is, that it was the pressure of the job or the societal expectations. But like reading the book and it's like he seems to have internalized it so much. And it's like I feel like more like it's it's his personality or it's like it's like a personality disorder because other people in the book were falling in love. And leaving for other jobs, or I think maybe he mentions like other cases of butlers and housekeepers getting married Mm -hmm. and presumably still working. So my reading was that this was rooted, yeah, in his dad and maybe just something about their personalities, where if it wasn't this, that was keep them making them keep other people at arm's length, it would have been something else. Yeah. But, and we don't get that side, like that personal side of his childhood, because the only thing we have to go on is Stevens's own account yeah. of, the, mm-hmm. of of what he wants to tell us. And it's like his, his mother doesn't exist in the story because it was 100 percent about trying to be a butler in his father's shoes. And uh, which is kind of interesting because, you know, how we've in you know, other times we've talked about unreliable narrators oh, yeah. uh, in this case, it's, it's almost like he was like a, just an I want to use the word term clueless, but like he he was convinced himself of mm-hmm. of the reality. And but we could read through the lines and sort of see mm-hmm. exactly what the real situation was. But he wouldn't. So I think at the very end, and he says something like, I might as well admit my heart was breaking. Yes. Uh, and I think that was the one moment I felt. There, that, were, there, yeah. were, there were a few things at the end. The other thing yeah. at the end that kind of got me feeling that too is where he was talking about how he never had his own mistakes. How um, Lord Darlington was a great man in the sense that he was able to have his own mistakes. But as his butler, he only had to work through Lord Darlington's mistakes. Mm. Uh, See, and I think that's, self, that's self-deception. Oh, right. oh, yeah. Like he made yeah. choices his whole life. He but, made choices. But he denies them. He denies that they were choices. Yeah. R- yes. Yeah. So what would you think his biggest mistake would be? Like he's obviously went through a situation at the end of the book where he's questioning his life and the way that it went. But I think I think he did everything totally in keeping with his character <laughs> and that there's no actual situation in which he could have done differently. Mm-hmm. Like realistically. Right. Even though Stevens was striving uh, to master the language, he didn't know the term work-life balance. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't really a thing maybe in uh, yeah. that time and place. but Well, and it was definitely like it is a different cultural environment from what we're what we've grown up in. Mm-hmm. Right. Because like everywhere he went and people kept mistaking him for a gentleman mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. because he had the, the suit and the uh, dignified the manner and stuff like that. And they deferred to him so much, right? Mm-hmm. Like everyone was like, oh, we have a gentleman here. Oh, well, let's do this for him and let's do this for him. And, and thank you, sir. And, you know, stuff like that. And we don't live in quite as deferential a society anymore. You don't just assume that someone deserves adulation because of their rank or their uh, birth or anything like that. I mean, Not some, as much. Some people, some people still walk around pretty it, sure that it, you're going to yeah. give it, them a lot of respect. But. It's interesting, though, because like I introduced myself as Mr. Chorney in the in the introduction. And I don't know that I've ever been called as mm. Mr. Chorney. And if I have, it has been very awkward for me. Yeah, right? <laughs> yeah. Well, we're not the fanciest people, though, either. Yeah. We're librarians, so... <laughs> That's true. <laughs> <laughs> but it's interesting, Dan, what you said about it's different in Britain, because I was thinking early on in the book with his new master or employer, Faraday, how he, he had those people over, and the woman kind of cornered uh, Stevens and said, well, you knew Lord uh, Darling, uh, ten, you know, you... 
uh, and he he denied it. He denied he ever worked mm-hmm. for him. And then yeah. and then he made Faraday look kind of like a chump. I think mm-hmm. is what he said. Mm-hmm. And, and he and he used the analogy. Well, it's it's like a marriage, and that if you were you know me and somebody who was on a you know the, 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 their second husband, it would just be poor form to talk about the first husband. Mm-hmm. And so that's that was like a very intimate, very close relationship. So he didn't know the term work life balance, but yeah. he did know the term married to work. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> exactly. And so it's interesting later on when he was in that pub. And he got into that very awkward situation where they were thinking he was a gentleman and he didn't really do anything to dissuade the mm-hmm. the local uh, village folk of it. Like, I, I was wondering, like, is that still him following the idea of dignity that he thought or or, or was he at that point? Like, just I, th- I thought that was like maybe his one little bit of fantasy yeah. in the whole world, in the whole world, in his whole world or in his whole life where he just kind of let himself kind of escape and maybe be the person that he wasn't which was kind of charming to see Mm -hmm. and very awkward to watch at the same Mm -hmm. time yeah the thing about uh, him like he talked a lot about dignity like it was the (laughs) central thing he was trying to attain he fell short right he defined the dignity of his job as being tied to the dignity of his employer and then it turned out his employer was a nazi sympathizer who got played for a patsy and so all of a sudden his whole worldview of himself as working for a righteous and upright and uh, morally praiseworthy individual, that all fell apart. Mm-hmm. But he he d- dedicated his life to it, and he worked really hard to be the best butler he could for this person who he had thought was great. Uh, I don't think he really came to terms with that. And when he was confronted by people asking, did you work for him? He denied it. Mm-hmm. And But he couldn't be honest with why he was denying it. That's why he mm-hmm. used this analogy, the marriage, and he... he He's an example of a person who will be very intelligent and can wor- reason his way around everything he's feeling to try to take his feelings out of it. But he was ashamed. He just couldn't come out and say he was ashamed because that would mean he was a failure. Mm-hmm. Right? Mm-hmm. It, it was, oh, man. It, you're, it was very hard to read in that sense because yeah, yeah. you just felt that kind of cringe about how he was trying to justify all of that. Mm-hmm. Well, yeah, it's an interesting style, too, because you get uh, Stevens. Uh, admitting something and then he goes on for pages and pages and tries to talk around it like mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. like how he still refers to the maid as Miss Kenton even though she's been married for 30 years or something and then he has this whole justification of why he does that and mm-hmm. why you know and, and it's just kind of he's delu- he's, he's, he's deluding himself it's, a bit and, I, I guess I, I do yeah. have friends like that though who have gotten married and changed their last names and in my mind like the, that first instance yeah. is the maiden name because mm-hmm. that's how they were defined mm-hmm. to me well, that's true. Like my brother had a friend growing up. Uh, he was always Danny. And I've since got to know him as an adult. And he goes by Dan now. Fair enough. <laughs> I cannot seem to call him Dan when I see him occasionally, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And uh, I just, yeah. I'm thinking, like, that's just, you know, I can't do it. I can't do it. Yeah. No, but I think that you're right that she's she's always going to be Miss Kenton to him. And she's always going to be, you know, the Coco in the evening person <laughs> doesn't matter how long she's been mrs ben so. i wonder how the book would have been received if it was actually called coco in the evening <laughs> <laughs> Coco in the evening. maybe it would have been and people would have thought it was more of a romance yeah you or know. the remains of the coco <laughs> <laughs> what did you guys think of miss kenton like did you think it was tragic like that she was so in love with stevens because it seemed like she to me, when you see stories of her being so in love with Stevens and then like going and marrying someone else and like taking like years to come to love the person that they've already married, like that just like snaps yeah. my heart in two. And then I'm like, did she ever really love her new husband or does she or is it some mm-hmm. lesser sort of love? Well, I mean, a couple of things. One is I think it would have been more tragic if she'd waited around for Stevens because he would have just been perfectly happy. Touché. Keeping things the way they were. <laughs> but also, I mean, at the time, not a ton of options mm-hmm. for a housekeeper. So if you, you can stay a housekeeper in the same house as a man who you love, who doesn't really want to be with you, or you can go off with this other guy and see what happens. So I think life was hard for her, but I think she had a certain amount of agency. More was agency she, than Stevens. More agency than well, a lot she, of people. She used her agency mm-hmm. and she yeah. did get out of that situation. Although, yeah, it seems like she was trying to essentially give him an ultimatum. Yeah. Oh, yeah. 
and he didn't go for it and she just kind of felt stunned and went off and did the thing she threatened to do she gave him lots of ultimatums though she gave him lots of like my favorite was when she she came out of her drawing room and she said she said something about him stomping around and it's like that was our first indication of steven's actual feelings Hmm. about what was going on between them because i i believe that he was stomping around i feel like like when he was crying and didn't realize it I think he was mad and he was like agitated and she could tell. Well, even even from his own words, he he would get very petty. Yeah. You know, it's like oh, when yeah. when her when Miss Kenton's aunt died. Yeah, and he was like questioning one of her And he he's like, "Oh, I I didn't uh I didn't extend my sympathies." And then the very next thing he does is yeah. go and start picking at little things. Something that wasn't cleaned properly. And yeah. it's like, "What the?" And he started yeah. doing a bunch of that right at that time when she was vulnerable. Like that's, how she, that's how he deals with emotions. Yeah. Yeah. yeah he, he, he fully inhabits the butler at that point. <laughs> oh, you know, yeah. he, he, he falls back on. But I feel like he's also like, like visually, like I would like to see, I would also like, I'd like to see the movie and we can talk about the movie, but I'd like, so I'd, but I'd like to see those scenes because you know what he, his memory of the dialogue is, but the way that it's delivered could have been very clear that he's upset, but he's trying to talk about this professional thing instead of what he's upset about. And I thought that would have been a very funny scene. I, I actually uh, didn't read the book with my eyes. I, I did the audio book, which was oh. um, narrated by Dominic West, who is, I think, most famous from The Wire. But he's been in a few other things, too. Anyways, he did a fantastic job in, mm. in, of really like playing that um, being upset about uh, butlery things, but really all the underlying emotions that oh, are, are really see. going going on. Yeah, I had seen the movie not long after it came out, I guess, in the 90s. Right. And I was the thing that impressed me about it was how understated everyone's behavior was and how the, all the subtext, you know, you had to pick up from that. I watched it again after reading the book, and I realized they, they really softened Stevens mm. for the movie, probably because the way he was portrayed in the book, he was a lot less likable. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, oh, I love him. <laughs> you love Stevens? I love Stevens. <laughs> so I, I got so upset with him. I didn't know Stevens. I mean, there, there was part, like, I love the, the language and the, you know, the, the voice of Stevens. I love diving into the character. Mm-hmm. But the man himself, I just got so upset with because of his denial of self yeah. to so the extreme. Did anyone see what Miss Kenton saw in Stevens? Yeah, maybe. I mean, maybe that's what it was. I don't know. But I think the other thing that I've been thinking a lot about this book and about the conversations about, like, say, in Sam and Rushdie's intro that I kind of disagree with some of his thoughts. Because, and I don't know if you are allowed to disagree with Mr. Rushdie or with the author of the book in terms of what you see. But what I see as being like so sad or whatever is actually fairly common experience for women mm. in terms of living life in service and wrapping your identity in somebody else's identity. Mm. And like, and they're using words like the life is thrown away. And I'm like, well, I mean, not really, because he did a really great job at this profession. And it's maybe a little bit snobby to say, I mean, this profession wasn't worthwhile because it's not what science. Mm. Like if he'd done made the same sacrifices for science, would that be okay? But anyway, the question was about Stevens and I'm trying to think of what my answer was going to be. (laughs) <laughs> what was the question? Uh, do you see why Miss Kenton was in love with Stevens? And then before that, we were talking about... Do we it, like Stevens? Do we like Stevens? <laughs> yeah. While Eric is thinking of her answer, yeah. uh, my my thoughts on Miss Kenton and Stevens are, are this, is that she maybe saw potential in, in yeah. Stevens in the same way that she saw potential in that one maid that she advocated to hire. And, and Stevens was like, mm, you know, she, she doesn't have a great resume. He goes, no, I can work with her. And then... He could see that. And also with her, the man that she eventually does marry, she says it takes her years to love him. So she isn't somebody that's going to like walk away easily. And one of the pivotal scenes for me was about a year after they had to dismiss those uh, maids because they were Jewish. Uh, And then Lord Darlington has a change of heart and he tries to kind of very like stupidly, oh, maybe we can try to track them down. And uh, and so there's a scene between Stevens and Miss Kenton where he kind of lightly says, oh, I remember a year ago uh, you were talking about leaving, Mm -hmm. uh, but you're still here. And then she says, well, you know, she kind of just lays all her cards on the table and she says, you know, uh, where was I going to go? I don't have a family. I have an aunt, but I can't live with her. And uh, this is my family. And I compromised like my values 
I'm still here a year later. Like as far as mm-hmm. like, yeah, giving lots of chances. Like she's almost mm-hmm. as I'm saying, like, look at me, stupid. I'm here. I'm here because of you, you know, not because this, that, and the other thing. And you could have at least told me, you could have given me, throw me a tiny bone about, yeah. you know, mm-hmm. how you felt a year ago. Because uh, it would have helped. Yeah, yeah. That's what I got. I thought maybe she was attracted to him partly because he's a man in authority. He's the head of the household. He is competent and does his job well. And and he can be nice and funny and other things at times, you know, in a very limited capacity. And often inadvertently. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But it's like, you know, he's a successful professional. He's at the top of his field. Mm-hmm. You know, the, we don't know how the Hay Society felt about him mm-hmm. or how other butlers did, but he was dedicated and he, he achieved his goals. Mm-hmm. You know, like you were saying before, he uh, we can question whether what he did was worthwhile, but he dedicated himself. I was thinking it's kind of like watching an Olympic athlete who spends years sacrificing mm-hmm. in order to get a gold medal. Except in this case, the gold medal is the approval of other butlers who feel the same way that you do. Mm. So it's a very small circle. Yeah, so what is the gold medal for him? But um, yeah. but yeah, I mean, to answer your original question is that, yeah, I think I could see what Miss Kenton saw because I think she was able to look past the snobby things he said. Like there was obviously a relationship there and she could see past the way he was, what he was saying to what he was really feeling and, and doing. I think maybe the only mistake is expecting that love to be the kind of relation, like a typical romantic relationship instead of just loving him for who he was, which was somebody for whom this job was very important and, you know, expecting things of him that were not realistic. And and like Dennis, I just recently watched the movie. I watched it last night. And uh, one of the main differences I found, uh, which is, gets no surprise, is that Anthony Hopkins and Emma Thompson are really good actors. <laughs> <laughs> and and so when you read the book, you, you, you can tell that, uh, you know, Stevens is, is deceiving himself and, and trying to deceive the reader. But when you see these two actors together, there really is quite a lovely interplay between the two of them where, where she's just, you could tell she's just trying to get his goat sometimes yeah. and he's not laying his guard down. And, uh, and you know, it, it is really quite, uh, there is more of a romantic feel in the, in the movie than there, than there is in the novel for sure and which almost softens the ending a little bit for me when i watched the movie last night because it was sort of like you know they had they had that goodness and, and that goodness lasted for as long as miss kenton was at the house and then it, it ended but it wasn't like a complete loss because there i, I felt like there they had something now it, it wasn't exactly what she was looking for but yeah the relationship the just the way that the the, ba- the banter as as stevens mm-hmm. might refer to it in the in the in the novel i found was there a lot more in the movie than than in the novel mm-hmm. yeah there's a, a very different i mean it's often the case that there's a very different feel between the book and the movie because the book lets you get it to the internal states of the character much more it's like the the scene where uh, his father dies in the movie you don't get the sense that he viewed the whole thing as a triumph the way that he did in the book. Because uh, unless he says it, you can't really tell because that's mm-hmm. all inside, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. you know, which is kind of shocking when it came to that point in the book where he's like talking about that evening and he's like, yeah, it was a triumph. That, that's mm-hmm. how this evening went. It was triumphant. <laughs> and, and in the movie, I, I, I was surprised too because there there is a bit more dialogue between the father and... And Stevens, uh, and I don't remember if this was in the book, but you can correct me if I'm wrong, where the father, senior, starts kind of unburdening his his heart to to Stevens and says, I, you know, I stopped loving your mother uh, and, and all these sort of things, uh, you know, and, and almost trying to have a final kind of reckoning, you know, with him. It was the only time the mother was really mentioned. And I was like, whoa, I don't remember that. I don't, I don't remember if there was actually... Yeah, I don't think the mother was no, ever mentioned no. in the book. Uh, and so that was kind of like, he was almost getting to that point where he could have a, a moment with his dad. And, and the, maybe that was the screenwriter's way of kind of like trying to make them look a little more human because mm. it's funny how there is no talk of the mother. And yet... Stevens is called upon to discuss the birds and the bees <laughs> with uh, that right. dude who's like 23. That's I mean, hilarious. And that was yeah. the best comedy in the whole thing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And uh, yeah. And just... how he was saying he was more into fish. <laughs> <laughs> and he was like, yeah. oh, well, all God's creatures, <laughs> all God's creatures are, uh, are uh, relevant, relevant to this discussion. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that was... <laughs> Just trying to picture Stevens trying to, and he and he did it right. He went yeah. forth and he tried because yeah. that was his job. He was given it, and he had no idea how to do it. Oh man! And it was completely misunderstood by the young man too. Right? Yes. <laughs> yeah. Totally. He thought he was talking about the strategy for the upcoming summit or whatever, and <laughs> figuring out with the uh, the French uh, representative. Oh my god! 
That's one of the other things about this book is like, you've got the character study of Stevens and then his relationship with uh, Miss Kenton, but then there's the whole, you know, thing going on in the background with uh, the Nazis and Lord Darlington and the war, the war and all of this stuff to which Stevens is essentially oblivious. He, he acts oblivious. Well, and I think he is like, I, I think he totally trusts Lord Darlington to the point where he's sure that whatever he's doing is best, mm. whatever it happens mm-hmm. to be. And I think even Lord Darlington was, uh, oblivious as well oh yeah he, like he, he was completely incompetent mm-hmm. in those matters too that just reminded me of that scene where uh, a couple of people were talking with darlington and they asked him in and they started asking him questions like you know about economic policy in europe and all that stuff and he even perceives at that moment that he's expected to not know this stuff uh, because he's he was struggling to kind of give them what they wanted and then yep. when he realized what they wanted was for him not to know then he was like, oh, yes, I cannot be of assistance in this matter, <laughs> mm-hmm. sir. Meanwhile, they are essentially degrading him, yeah. um, insulting him, using it as a, a, him as an example of why you shouldn't trust citizens to have a vote, mm-hmm. yeah. essentially. And he's just happy to stand there and, and get made fun of for someone else's point and just to trust that that's for the best. Mm-hmm. That was a hard scene to, <laughs> to read. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But then Darlington did apologize. Yeah, but at the same time... It doesn't, that doesn't really. It, it, it was, yeah, was kind of like an know? empty apology, as as like I apologize, but it really had to happen. Mm-hmm. Yeah, kind of. Yeah, yeah, and you know, he still considered it a valid point. Is the problem? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Like, well, I'm sorry you had to be treated that way, even though it was all correct, and you really are someone who shouldn't be trusted with a vote. You shouldn't and, have a vote. Yeah. Yeah. So one of the things I think about this is how much Stevens puts into his job. And in real life, I don't even know if I've, I know people who put that much into their job. Maybe I do. But I'm just like wondering if, like, I feel like I don't even come close to that, to, to being able to put myself into the job. <laughs> He's a workaholic, it, you know? A, a, yeah, a bit. <laughs> Well, some people refer to their jobs like as as callings or, you know, or they have a passion for something and that kind of thing. So, I, you know, I hear you can there's maybe a modern equivalent of that where somebody just believes in what they're doing. Oh, for uh, sure. You know, you know are, I, I heard something interesting that I think in, in North America, more than other places, people are defined by their jobs where it's a very common question when you're first meeting someone to say, what do you do? As in mm-hmm. what is your profession or what what do you do for work? And in, in other countries that that's not quite the case. I mean, it's British. <laughs> it is. Yeah. You know, the class yeah. anywhere with a class system, it's going to be largely defined by either if like, if, well, for example, in England, like for a long time, if you worked, you were not a gentleman, right? A gentleman didn't need professions, but it's a lot of it's defined by how you spend your day. So I'm curious if anyone, if, if, if people around the table would define themselves by your work. Or I think your I job. do. I think I do, but not to as great an extent, obviously. Yeah, because when you think of it, you know, if you're working full time, you spend more time with your coworkers at your place of work than you do with anyone else in your life, including, mm-hmm. you know, family. Mm-hmm. Uh, if you, you know, over the course of your working life, so hopefully you can do find something that you enjoy or 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 find interesting, and because otherwise I would just be really sad. So yeah, I think those parts of it I identify with because. Like, I feel like I actually enjoy going to work. I look mm-hmm. forward to it. The, the, you know, the things that I, I get to do on a daily basis and the people I, I help and work with. So in that way, I, I think I define myself. But uh, it's interesting, like the title of the book, The Remains of the Day, suggests that when your working day is done, all that's left is the remains, right? Mm-hmm. The, the hour or so in your, mm-hmm. in your butler's pantry. And I heard a thing on the, on the CBC the other day talking about this concept of shadow work. Uh, Mm -hmm. And how nowadays shadow work is sort of like the idea of so many little tasks that we do outside of our paid work, Mm -hmm. we have to do. Like we don't call a travel agent. We book our own flights. We book Mm -hmm. our own cars. We we check out our own groceries. We uh, this, that, the other thing. And it's sort of uh, sold to us as as given, you know, the freedom to do it. But at the same time, all those little things, we don't we don't sort of account for what our time is worth. Time Mm -hmm. is the one thing that we have this definitely finite. And so then even the remains of our day already, there's, there are less remains in our day. And, and this, this person who had written about it said that uh, the whole idea of leisure time uh, is disappearing because mm-hmm. you don't really have the idea of you work and then you get away from work. Mm-hmm. You, you either work and then you're doing other things that are like work that are not the things that you maybe 
who knows whether that's true, but yeah. it was an interesting yeah. idea. Well, it's mm. it's interesting to think about in terms of like how you see yourself as, I guess, a, a functional person, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Um, wow. but like, looks not, looks well, overstated. Like, I, like I'm torn, right? Like part of me is like, yeah, I'm an adult. I do my own laundry. I do my own dishes. Um, I clean my apartment. And then part of me is like, maybe I should pay people to do that for me, you mm-hmm. know, because I guess, <laughs> and, but then part of me even saying that is like, no, that's not an adult thing to do. But, but what you're saying is, is that that is just like another, another form of work. So if, you know, you can pay someone and it's beneficial for everybody involved, people getting fair wages, uh, et cetera, then is, is there a problem there? But I think it, it would still feel weird or maybe at first. I have two thoughts about that because I think about that kind of thing a lot. One of them is that they did a study and, and I can't remember who, sorry, I, but somebody somewhere did a scientific study about, um, Checks out. <laughs> yeah, about money and about money bringing happiness. And they, they found that the only time that money consistently brings happiness is when you can use it to buy more time. So mm-hmm. when you hire um, somebody to help you with the things that need to get done, but that take up a lot of time, like the mm-hmm. things you were mentioning. Yeah. The second thing is that I really loved in The Number One Ladies Detective Agency by Alexander McCall Smith. It takes place in Gaborón. And the character, Maura Matsui, she says, if you have the money to pay somebody to come and clean your house, mm-hmm. you have to do it. Mm-hmm. Because otherwise, you're keeping somebody from having a job. Because mm-hmm. um, she has a housekeeper who is also a housekeeper for two or other families or something like that. And that's just considered selfish. If you can pay for somebody somebody to do a job for you, but you insist on doing it anyway. Um, and I kind of like that hmm. that idea. In some cultures, too, it's much more common to have housekeepers. Mm -hmm. Like I I was reading something not long ago about, I think it was in India, where it was very common for people to hire someone to come and clean their homes and Mm -hmm. stuff like that. Even if you were a person who worked as a house cleaner, Mm -hmm. you might also pay someone to come clean your house, (laughs) which is this interesting circle of work where everyone's cleaning someone else's house, but not their own. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, I think it is very different here. Like I've had, I knew friends growing up who had people who came and cleaned their house and they kept it very on the DL because it was Mm. embarrassing for them. Because you're supposed to be independent. Because you're supposed to be independent yeah. or, you know, you're seen as super rich or something mm-hmm. like that, which has, you know, whatever negative common connotations that, that comes along with that. I think I could deal with the negative connotations of someone thinking I'm super rich. <laughs> <laughs> it took me a long time to get used to using my dishwasher, though. Like, I had to really, like, it felt, I like, I think... Uh, I have a dishwasher in my apartment and it's the first time I had to, a dishwasher as an adult and like for the first year, I didn't use it because it felt lazy to <laughs> not do my own dishes, even though, you know, if you're doing a fully loaded dishwasher, they say that it's more energy efficient mm-hmm. than than doing the dishes by hand. So, or at least you're, that's you're what I tell now. myself. You're fancy yeah. now, and you just got to get used to it. I'm the other way. I grew up with a, a dishwasher and ever since we've had our house, we it's have not, not nice had to one. think of your mom that way. <laughs> 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 and now I just do dishes. And now it's kind of like, I kind of like it like yeah. I, or something like mm-hmm. I, I, I know, okay, this is like going to be 20 minutes or whatever. I'm going to put some music on or a podcast or mm-hmm. visit and, mm-hmm. and just kind of get it done. So it's, it's again, mm-hmm. I don't know. It's just a meditative thing. nature to kind it. Of, yeah. You know, I'd rather wash than dry. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> I'd rather read. <laughs> so, so back to dignity. Uh, we asked if uh, you had to describe Stephen's most significant characteristic. Would it be dignity? If not, what characteristic would be appropriate? Delusional? <laughs> <laughs> that would be my choice. I was going to go with something stubborn-ish. He's just so set on what he believes that even if he stops believing it for a little bit, he has to talk himself back into believing it. Yeah. Yeah. Single-minded, maybe. Single-minded. Yeah. Like someone who can literally dedicate their entire life to a single purpose. A single and idea. Like, I guess, like, we've kind of been like, this is like almost, I don't know, maybe this is going back to what Erica said earlier, but that this is almost, to do it as a butler doesn't seem worthwhile, but it could be worthwhile if you were doing it. What, it, what you said yeah, as but a why scientist. doesn't it seem worthwhile as a butler? Like, why do we look yeah. down on service? Well, I mean, because... Like, 
We're all in service. We don't I, I, live where we work, but we dedicate I, our lives I, I'm, I'm to this idea of service. I'm wondering if maybe because this is the dedication of service to one person, whereas if you're dedicating your life to science, in some sense, you're dedicating your life, I, if you do it well, to humanity. I mean, he would argue he is dedicating his life to humanity, but also, and it's not, I mean, it is, it's Lord Darlington is the focal point, but he's yeah. also running a house Yeah, that... Like he's, well, it's well, like he, managing a small business. I, I mean, yeah. Right? So he he definitely so believes that because he talks skill, about the hub. There's the training hub, yeah. in, the, in the wheel. I, do, yeah. I just like it's. I'm just I'm I'm pushing back against this idea that what he did for his job for his life wasn't worthwhile and that it was a waste because I don't see it that way. I have great respect for labor and work and dedication, and I think uh, like. There's kind of a, a sense sometimes that certain jobs are beneath people or yeah. things like that. Uh, there's that great TV series, uh, Dirty Jobs, with Mike Rowe, where he would follow people doing jobs that most people would not want to do. Mm -hmm. And it was born out of, like, he had discovered, he was in a building and there were these things way up there. And he's like, man, I wonder how they clean them. And a guy says, well, I go up there on a ladder and I do it all by hand. Mm -hmm. And then he's like, well isn't there like some automated way to do it? And it's like, no, this is the only way to do it. And so someone has to do it. So he started the show to display all these different things that people had to do because there was no other way to do it. And to show the respect and dignity that goes with doing a job well. Yeah. So, so this is my preface to my response to that is I don't think that, uh, the work he was doing was beneath doing or anything like that. I think the problem with Stevens and his dedication to his job is that it came at the complete sacrifice of his own humanity. He gave up everything that we typically think of as defining a person, any of the positives like the emotional connection to other people or to family or to friends or to pursuing any kind of creative pursuit. He gave everything, mm -hmm. literally everything to this one task. I mean, he chose it too. So like, you know, for him... Maybe it was worth it in the end, even though it was really hard to tell by anything that he said in the book. I mean, but at the same well, time, I don't wish that upon any human being. Well, see there, <sighs> I'm going to have to take more whatever, because the other thing that we're circling around in this discussion is the idea that romantic love, marriage and kids should be what people want. And that's because he didn't have that. He's wasted his life. Whereas we started off the conversation mm -hmm. by saying, or human connection, like maybe he's a solitary person. Maybe, whereas we started off by saying, would a relationship with them, between them have ever worked? And we mm -hmm. said no. And we didn't say no because of his job. We said no because of who he was. Yeah. So. And maybe, maybe I'm reading Dennis wrong, but I don't know if it's specifically the lack of a family or the lack of that close relationship. It's the lack of maybe variety in any sense. Like. When a person dedicates themselves so fully to something that there's nothing else left, mm -hmm. I mean, like, you get the it, remains of the day. I, I acknowledge it's a difficult question uh, ah. because people do have the right to choose what they want to do. Mm -hmm. And uh, you can do anything you want, no matter what anyone else thinks, as long as you're willing to accept the consequences that go with that. And so maybe for Stevens, this was something that's worthwhile. But it it's just... It, it's it's a tough balance though. It, like it's a tough thing to think about in terms of you know to you want people to be able to choose whatever they want, but there's there's a lot to be said when people have guidance in certain direction, you know, and expanding who you are as a as a. And you talk about work life balance and things like this, yeah. Well, and which also, is a, which is a newer concept. Well, and also expectations yeah. like parental expectations. It's clear that his yeah. father directed his life in the like because he was working in service from a very young age mm -hmm. right like as a what, like 12 yeah, or 14 or something like that any of this how much yeah. of it was chosen how much of was of it was imposed by the society where this was the type of thing people were directed to but yeah but no, i mean it, on the, it's not a clear-cut it's question. not a, he's it wasn't a bad life you know he had safe warm place to live he had food he wasn't physically or emotionally or psychologically abused. We, well, you could argue about his dad and <laughs> the whatever. Yeah. But you know what I mean? Like for a lot of people, yeah. especially had, at the time, that's a pretty sweet life. He, he, he in the house, it. he had the status of being like yeah. right under the the owner, right? Like right under yeah. the Lord. When I was reading this and thinking about Stevens, I couldn't help but think about Carson. From I absolutely always thought of Carson. Down Abbey. For, yeah. And there was a very similar, for anyone that's not, 
seen the television show Downton Abbey, there's a butler in a house that's very much like Darlington called Carson. Uh, the difference with Carson is that, well, I don't know if this is, is even a difference, but he does have an ongoing friendship slash relationship with Mrs. Hughes, mm-hmm. uh, the head uh, housekeeper, I guess. Yeah. So it's a very much of a uh, Miss Kenton. But because that's a TV show that's gone on for many years, it eventually kind of like, will they or won't they? And mm-hmm. uh, and eventually it jumps the shark and they get married. And then it's that jumping the shark? Well, because it's like, will they, won't they? Well, they will. And then they did. And then they get a little cottage and it keeps going on and yeah. on. So that's a different kind of situation. But, but that's uh, what you would have wanted for Stevens, maybe. Yeah, you maybe. Know, like, have it work out. Uh, yeah. she, didn't, she, also, she didn't try to change him like is the thing she kind right. of accepted Carson as he was and he was very dignified all the time the holiday season is upon us and what that means for many people is a time for gathering with friends and family reflecting on the past year and looking forward to the future some people even like to get into crafts not me of course I wouldn't know the pointy end of a needle from the other pointy end of a needle and knitting come on now But luckily for those out there who self-identify as crafters or craft enthusiasts, Winnipeg Public Library has the perfect maker lab for you. The craft maker lab will be set up at the Westwood Library Monday, December 9th and Thursday, December 12th from 6 to 8 p.m. and also on Saturday, December 14th from 2 to 4. Get busy with a variety of craft supplies and try your hand with a spirograph, a button making machine, and something called a typewriter. What's a typewriter, you ask? Nobody knows. But if you come to the Maker Lab, you'll find out, I bet. You don't have to register for the lab. Just show up and let the creativity take over. That's how crafts work, right? So so speaking of uh, Downton Abbey being similar to this, I'd, I'd like to segue into our most awkwardly worded segment. Can you tell me a book you would also like? I was going to mention Downton, especially the scenes between Mr. Carson and Mrs. Hughes, most often in her parlor, I think is what they'd called it. But the other one that I was reminded of a lot reading it was actually The Rosie Project by Graham uh, Simpson, because it's a first person narrative with an unreliable narrator. And this fellow who in the book, it's it's often suggested that he's on the autism spectrum or he has Asperger's or something like this. And what really reminded me of it was the way in which he would be recounting something that happened. And as the reader, you could see what was going on a lot clearer than he could see what was going on, especially in terms of romantic relationship. And I really liked that about both of these books where you're kind of going, oh, Stevens, or you're going, oh, whatever his name was in uh, Rosie Project. Mm. Rosie Project by Graham Simpson. It's actually the first of a trilogy. Very good. I am going to recommend uh, Never Let Me Go by Kaizu Ishiguro because it was the first book by him that I ever read. Uh, Like Remains of the Day, Never Let Me Go is an intensely character-driven novel. Because of this, the genre of the novel has come to some dispute as it has been described as quasi-science fiction, a sci-fi thriller, a coming-of-age novel, or even horror. But if you're skeptical that a book about butlers could hold your interest, yet fell in love with The Remains of the Day, uh, ignore the plot of Never Let Me Go and let the characters break your heart if what you liked about the remains of the day was a detailed root talk of a drive into the west country then i will recommend to you the death of mrs westaway by ruth ware this is a recent thriller and the louis rail book club is reading it this month which is why i read it let me just give you just a tiny synopsis harriet westaway is barely making ends meet as a tarot card reader on the brighton pier when she receives a mysterious letter out of the blue from a lawyer in cornwall expressing his sympathies on the death of her grandmother and inviting her to town for the funeral and the reading of the will as she is one of the main beneficiaries the only problem is harriet was raised by her mom never knew her dad and her only grandma passed away years ago a case of mistaken identity still though she could really use the money Mm -hmm. And she has the uncanny knack of being able to read people with the skills she's honed as a tarot card reader. So she sets off for the West Country to see what she can get away with. Hilarity ensues. Well, not really hilarity. I'm just joking about that. But it's very interesting to see. Yeah, it's very good. I thoroughly enjoyed it. Lots of little twists and very gothic, very uh, Daphne du Maurier. Uh, So I recommend The Death of Mrs. Westaway by Ruth Ware. Nice. I sometimes think we should change the name of the podcast to Unreliable Narrator because it's a, <laughs> it's a big theme. Yeah, and I, I, so on that theme, uh, I'm going to recommend The Girl on the Train by Paula Hawkins. The, there's a couple of narrators because it switches point of view at a, a few points, but the primary narrator is very unreliable. And you figure that out fairly soon 
And it's a mystery. And a big part of the mystery as a reader is just figuring out what the narrator is actually talking about or responsible for and what has happened to her and around her. Uh, I found it very interesting when I read through it. And apparently they're going to make a movie or they did make a movie. I I haven't looked I, to see. Yeah, I, I knew that was very popular. So it doesn't surprise me that. A yeah, but movie. Uh, Girl on the Train by Paula Hawkins. Girl on the Train. And now it's time for everyone's favorite segment, Nerd Words for Word Nerds, the part of each show where our hosts boil down their most prevalent thoughts of the past month into one word. Erica, do you want to go first? <laughs> <laughs> see, I was going to try not to, but sure. Um, I can I, see I, you like. I, I, was, I was like, don't say anything. Don't say anything. We could just, sure. Um, I like to get it done. So my word is uh, meniscus. Ooh. And that's a word that I remembered. I believe I originally learned it in home ec or something, but it could have been in um, high school science. And I was doing something in the kitchen. I was I was measuring out water and it re- popped into my head. And so I, I taught um, my kid meniscus and, I, and she thought that was a pretty good sounding word. So that's my word. If you haven't heard that in a while, um, the meniscus is the, at the, the surface tension of water. Say you can especially see it through a glass container where you can see the water curling up the sides of the container. Uh, it comes from the Greek for crescent. It's the curve in the upper surface of a liquid close to the surface of the container or another object caused by surface tension. It can be either concave or convex depending on the liquid and the surface. So it can either be shaped like a bowl or shaped like a little hill. A concave meniscus occurs when the particles of the liquid are more strongly attracted to the container than to each other, causing the liquid to climb the walls of the container. This occurs between water and glass. Water-based fluids like sap, honey, and milk also have a concave meniscus in glass or other wettable containers. Conversely, a convex meniscus occurs when the particles in the liquid have a stronger attraction to each other then to the material of the container. Convex menisci occur, for example, between mercury and glass in barometers and thermometers. So there's your little science I lesson from did Wikipedia. not know they could be concave or convex. I wow. learned something new. So you there could say you that uh, Stevens had a convex uh, meniscus because he was more attracted to the walls. <laughs> <laughs> Is that how that works? No. Did I understand? No, no, no. no. Yes, I mean, you could say, you could say co- convex because he was more like self-contained. Then spreading out. So that's what oh, I would say. Convex. I see. I see. Little hill. Mm. Stick to himself. That's my takeaway. <laughs> that's my takeaway. Good. I'll uh, go next with aspire. One definition of aspire is to direct one's hopes or ambitions towards achieving something. And just reading the book, uh, like I said, it was a character study, and a lot of it focused around essentially Stephen's aspirations to be the ultimate butler. I've never aspired to anything the way that Stevens aspired <laughs> to having dignity. I mean, probably a good thing is pretty obsessive. Yeah, so. um, but aspire. Hmm. Good word. Yeah. Good. My word comes from a word or a phrase that we've been hearing a lot uh, recently. It's also the first time I heard it was when I was a teenager and I snuck in to see the movie, another Anthony Hopkins movie, The Silence of the Lambs. And the word is quid pro quo or the phrase. <laughs> and uh, you may remember Dr. Hannibal Lecter saying quid pro quo, Clarice, you tell me things, I tell you things. And it basically just means something for something. Uh, you, you've sometimes heard the term tit for tat which I always thought meant it was like it evolved from this for that. But apparently tip for tat uh, it comes from tip for tap. Yeah. Uh, so I don't know what to think now. <laughs> Is that like a bar thing where you tip for the what's on tap? Oh, maybe, maybe, <laughs> maybe. Uh, it also, uh, in English common law, for a contract to exist, there has to be an exchange called consideration. So that's why you sometimes hear someone sell something or buy something for $1. It's mm-hmm. not just to be cute. It's because it has to satisfy the notion that there is a valid contract, that there's been an exchange, not merely a gift. So a quid pro quo in itself isn't anything sinister or or weird. It happens all the time. But if the intent behind it is corrupt or if you're trying to use it for personal reasons, then maybe there's certain countries in the world that look upon it askance. (laughs) So if I have this correctly, the absence of a quid pro quo may invalidate a contract, but the presence of a quid pro quo may invalidate a presidency. (laughs) No quid pro quo, Trevor. There was no quid pro quo. Don't you know? Okay. Good one. (laughs) Uh, 
Uh, jumping off the idea of uh, old movies, I don't know if anyone remembers the film Garden State, uh, mm-hmm. the little indie movie that introduced the world to the song New Slang by the Shins, uh, which Natalie Portman's character in the film states uh, that this song will change your life. So I've been revisiting the song lately because I discovered an amazing cover version by the band uh, Vallis Alps, which of course sent me down the rabbit hole of uh, what the lyrics of the song mean, uh, which led me to an interview by the writer of the original song, James Murphy in which he says that new slang is about the Saturn return part of my life. And I had no idea of the term Saturn return, never Mm. heard it before. So it sounded cool. So I looked it up. Saturn return uh, in horoscopic astrology is an astrological transit that occurs when the planet Saturn returns to the same place in the sky that it occupied at the moment of a person's birth. So approximately 29 and a half years. Um, So psychologically, the first Saturn return is seen as the time of reaching full adulthood and being faced perhaps with the first time with the adult challenges and responsibilities. So, which I thought was interesting, while I hold zero stock in the idea of astrology, even though I might buy a lot of people enter into their 30s as a period of transition, I think uh, this would be a case of coincidence versus causation. But I do think the term comes across as a bit romantic um, and an elegant way to talk about that time in your life. And I wish I had known about it uh, when I was in the Saturn Returns part of my life. When you were 29 I got, and a half. <laughs> when I was 29 and a half, I would have gone around saying that all the time. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Um, That's awesome. So, unfortunately, we have to sign off for this month. So thank you very much, dear readers, for tuning in to this, our XXIII episode of the Time to Read podcast. Uh, in December, join us as we read William Goldman's classic, The Princess Bride. Get in on the conversation by finding us on Facebook or emailing us at wpl-podcast.winnipeg.ca. We'd love it if you hit subscribe in iTunes or your favorite podcast service, and we'd love it even more if you gave us a five-star rating. And until next time, make sure you find Time, time to Read. read. Thanks for joining us for this episode of the Time to Read podcast. We were talking about The Remains of the Day by Kazuo Ashigiru. Time to Read is a production of the Winnipeg Public Library. Our panel today included Alan Chorney, Dennis Penner, Erica Ball, and Trevor Lockhart. Kirsten will return in a future episode. Our webmaster is Aaron Seaburn. Our social media guru is Regan Brew. Audio production and music by Dennis Penner. You can be a part of the show, too. Email us at wpl-podcast at winnipeg.ca with suggestions for books that you'd like us to read and discuss, and comments and questions about the book we're reading for our next show. Visit us on the web at wpl-podcast.winnipeg.ca. Check out our show notes with links to some of the things we talked about today, and take part in discussions about the books we're reading. You can also join our Facebook group. Next month, we're reading The Princess Bride by William Goldman. We're looking forward to hearing what you think about it. Society, or whatever they're called. Remember oh, the, that's the, right. the, the Brotherhood of yeah. Butlers? Butlers. Oh, snobby, yeah. snobby Butlers. Yeah. The Secretive Society of Butlers. Yeah. That only other butlers know about. Yeah. They were not transparent. And only some of them. <laughs> no transparency <laughs> no from transparency. the butlers <laughs> on what's expected well, kept, of the butlers. They kept demanding answers from the society, and the society yeah. would not give them answers. It was really short sighted, really. It really yeah. was. Yeah. It must have been demoralizing the they to the butlers. That. Yeah. yeah so. <laughs> Poor butlers. Just trying to be professional.